sent you yesterday. Um, there, there is a meteor shower. There was a meteor shower this weekend. So it's going to peak last weekend. And then there was another one this coming weekend. So November 18 and 13. So the Earth, it's going to be crossing path with a storm of debris. So those debris have two sources. One swarm comes from um, a comet. It's a comet. Do you see the name here? Ankh, it's called the comet Ankh. And apparently the comet Ankh was destroyed, shattered in pieces by an asteroid. And this is the name of the asteroid. Okay, so next weekend, the, the Earth will cross path with the broken pieces from the asteroid and last weekend it crossed path with the broken pieces from, from that uh, comet. Okay, so if, um, especially if you're not around Miami, if you are inside, more west, uh, you have less, less uh, light pollution. So it's a great opportunity, you know, to, to see those meteor showers. And then if you have a job interview, you can say, you know, every November I go outside and watch those meteor showers. And I didn't miss the one from 2023 because it's peaking. So it peaks every seven years. So every seven years, you know, it's going through the, really the, the center of the swarm. So you have a very strong meteor shower. And it's called the toroid, the, not the toroid, so I'm thinking physics here, the toroid. Toroid comes from um, Taurus. Taurus is the bird, right? It's a constellation uh, Taurus. Let's see, I have a picture here. You see Taurus, you already know that constellation. And you have Adebaran here, you know, the, the fiercy eye of the Taurus. It's a super giant. And you're going to see here coming from this part of the constellation and this part of the constellation. And let's see, I have even a picture here that I taken from somewhere. So I have two, two parts okay, we, that, will cross, that will cross our path. So this is the Earth path. You see how it's crossing here and then it's going to cross there. And, um, what else? Okay, so that that paper I was was last year, but this one is from this year. So this year you really have a peak, and otherwise you have to wait for seven years for that to happen again. Here I have some video, just just a short video of what it looks like. Boom! Did you see the tray, the luminous tray? That's because you remember when the meteorite enters the Earth atmosphere because friction, it's going to be heating up, which is a good thing for us, so it will disappear. And, but it will leave like a trail, um, a luminous trail behind. You see the trail here? This is because as it's going to heat up the atmosphere, it's going to excite the molecules. Molecules go to a higher level of energy, and then they come back to a lower level of energy. They, they're going to burp out energy in the form of light, photons, right? Here I have another short video. You see the swarm here crossing the path of the Earth. Isn't that cool? Okay, that was my announcement for today. So we are talking, uh, for that you need about the distance ladder and how to find the distance in the universe, right? What, what are the meter sticks that we are using? And it goes step by step. So first, a good value for the astronomical unit had to be found. So astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Once, once this is found, okay, then you can calibrate the other meter stick. So you can calibrate the CFID, the, you, you can calibrate the parallax technique that we'll talk about, and that technique will calibrate the next technique and so forth and so on and until the end of the universe. 
just just after the Big Bang. So we stopped here. So in the 18th century, okay, you, you have mathematicians. Um, one one was German, the other one was French. But the German one is the most famous who used data collected during Venus transit. Okay, so what is a Venus transit? When you have Mercury and Venus, because they are between us and the Earth, right? They're gonna go around like this because they go faster, so they're gonna go past us. And from the Earth, you're gonna see the projected uh, shadow of of the. Um, no, you you're gonna see the, the projection of that that um, planet here on on the sun. So I just have a short video to show you what it looks like. It's called the transit. Except I'm not in the right folder here. Transit, and what it looks like. You see the planet going around its orbit, and as seen from us, you see you can compute the time it takes for the planet, you know, to go across the sun. It doesn't go, doesn't need to go across just at the uh, diameter here, just at the center, it can be depends where you are located on Earth. Is that clear? So you can have a transit for Venus and a transit for Mercury because those planets are between us and the Sun. And in the 18th century, they got such a genius idea, right? They, they observed that transit from two locations on Earth. And farther away are those locations, the best it is. So one location was in Tahiti, okay? And it just happened that you have a very famous uh, explorer, Captain James Cook. He's famous because he, um, he went to different places like Australia, and he was the first one to map part of Australia. He went to Hawaii, he went to uh, Tahiti, Tahiti Ridge, Tahiti, yes, Tahiti, he went to Tahiti and he was known to be uh, friendly with the native uh, population. So you can see him, there is a whole picture, it's not a picture of course, but it's a painting here. Uh, on uh, his expedition to uh, Tahiti, he took some uh, scientists with him and they observed here the transit of Venus, right? So they carefully computed the time it took for Venus to pass in front of the Sun. Okay, so the data were brought back to uh, in Europe especially uh, Germany, where you had a very good mathematician. And the same observation was made from Mexico. The place in New Mexico was called Baya, California, Mexico. So what's the idea? If you observe from that transit here, so of course here yeah, it's not Tahiti, but it's just for the principle to understand how they did it. It's a very smart way to do it, right? From two locations, you observe the transit, okay? So the transit for one place, it's gonna be observed going from here to there, from another place going from here to there. And then those data were brought to a mathematician, especially a German one, Johann, George von Soldner, I'm not sure if I say it right. And what he did is that using the time of transit and geometry, he was able to find that distance here. You see? Are you with me on that? And look, it's very simple geometry. That distance here is to this distance. So they knew the distance between uh, Mexico, Baya, California, and Mexico, and Tahiti. So if you know this distance here, and if you know that angle there, okay, and, and if you if you know that that uh, distance here, then you can find the distance between the sun 
and Venus. And once you have the distance between the Sun and Venus, then you can find the astronomical unit. So here you have the geometry. It says that distance here is to this distance there, what that distance here is to that distance there. So if you remember geometry from a high school, you have what it's called a similar triangles. So that large base over this small base of this triangle here, you see you have two triangles. Can you see the triangles? See, you have one triangle here, another triangle there, and they have the same angle there, right? Very simple geometry, okay? Nothing to, uh, to pull your hair over. So big base here over small base equals large distance here over small distance here. And that's, that, that's simple, very simple math. In that case, what was not simple math was to find that distance here using the time it takes to go from here to there and the time it takes to go from there to there. Once what that was done, you know you are just solving a ratio. I didn't lose you. Right, you still with me? So the distance here, so big base over small base equals big distance over small distance. And they knew that the distance between the sun and Venus was 0.7 AU. The distance between Earth and Venus was 0.3 AU. And that way they could find the distance. So they had a good value, an absolute value for the first time, a better one than it was done before by the Greek. Right? So they, they have found a distance of 153 million kilometers, and the true value is 149, 150. So it's still error, okay? But it's getting better. Those who are in engineering, for example, or if you love math or geometry, have a YouTube video here that will explain step by step how it's done. It's very simple geometry in that case. It's just like a middle school geometry. I remember my son used to be in middle school and he used to uh, learn about similar triangles. Okay, so it's not, not that hard. So that was done by, thanks to James Cook expeditions around the world. I think he, he, I think he tried to go around the world. I don't know, you have to look it up if if succeed or not. And it was also done independently by another mathematician uh, here, Jérôme Lalande, but he didn't use the same uh, locations. So the best, best estimation that we had, and that was only in 18th century, during the 18th century, was the data from those two locations, Tahiti and, and Mexico. Isn't that interesting? Only in the 18th century. Okay, so then technology improved, especially after the war. Okay, because what happened during the war, uh, the British developed the radar. Okay, so radar is that technology where you can send like a microwave. Okay, so it's an electromagnetic wave that bounces off airplanes, for example. So in that case, it can bounce off the moon. You know the speed of flight. Okay, you know how long it takes to ping back so you can find the distance. So that was used by the British when the German, you know, tried to invade England and it was highly classified. But after the war, they unclassify it and they use it to make microwaves, which is very useful. But also they use it to measure the distance to the moon, like a better, better uh, uh, measurement of the distance to the moon. And you know who was involved? You remember Luis Alvarez? He did so many things, you know, he got the Nobel Prize, he was involved in the atomic bomb, he was involved in uh, what killed the dinosaurs, he was the one who found the iridium layer, 
uh, he, he was the one who got the idea to highlight the great pyramid with uh, particles from space. So a very, very smart, bright scientist. Okay, and then in the 1960s, they used that same technology of the radar to pin Venus. Okay, so they sent radio waves to Venus, so it looks easy, but of course it was not that easy to do, but they ping, they ping Venus, so the signal reached Venus and went back. Okay, so in the 1960s, finally, they got a very good number for the distance between Earth and the Sun, which is uh, one AU, one astronomical unit. Once that was done, finally, we knew all the absolute distances okay, of, of the planets and, and the sun, first of all. And then we used that here, that value to calibrate the next uh, technique. That technique is called the parallax technique. By the way, I forgot to tell you that um, uh, that technique here that you see, it's called also parallax, the parallax method, because from different locations on Earth, you see, it, it looks like the, the planet is shifting. So this is called parallax method. So if you take your uh, finger, can you take your finger here like that? You see, you have two eyes, and, and you have two eyes for a reason. So close one eye, look at your finger, and then you look at the other eye, and, and you, you close the other eye. What's happening to your finger? Very good. It's shifting sideways, right? So move your finger farther away. Is that shifting less or more? Less. That's how brain can tell the perspective. So Terence, you didn't try, but it's fine. So I see Terence, I can see that Terence is further away than Ashley. How come? Because our brain understands parallax. He uses that, right? It's like our brain say, okay, Ashley is shifting more. Terence is shifting less. So brain can understand depth. Right, so how, how far it is from me. Is, isn't brain amazing? Okay, without me thinking parallax, right? The brain knows parallax. So that's, that's what they did here. This is also called the parallax method. The other thing that um, um, I forgot to tell you about the moon. So the first they use radar to find a distance to the moon and then in the 1970s, they found a different method to measure even uh, better, in a better way, the distance to the moon in, uh, during the Apollo mission. Remember the Apollo program is when they were trying to reach the moon and they did in 1969. So I think it was Apollo 11 with um, Aldrin and Armstrong. So they placed on the moon what we call a retro reflector. Okay, so when you use a laser from the earth, the laser is gonna come here and it's gonna bounce back exactly in the same direction. So this is a, a retro reflector. So that was in 1969. And then they placed another one, a better one, more advanced in 1971 with Apollo. 15. So you, you might think that, okay, what's a retro reflector? That's what you have uh, behind bikes, for example, here. Okay, so if, if you have a car, you know, it's the, 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 the light from the car is going to bounce off and that's going to become shiny. Okay, even though there is no battery, there is no light bulb inside, it's reflecting light. Another example, it's cats. Cats have like retro reflector inside their eyes, right? Because light will bounce off. And that's why cats can be very scary. It's like the wolves, right? They have like uh, bright eyes. 
cat eyes. That's why we say cat eyes, right? Join um, at night. So this is how a retro reflector works, right? It's bouncing up, and those little cubes here make up the whole retro reflector. So it's not just one cube, it's many of them. And you see light will bounce off. Isn't that interesting? So don't don't think that your cat is being possessed. Right? This is just the technology in the, in the eyes. Okay, so that was even a better method that using um, reg, uh, radar to find the distance to the moon. Okay, so we we were at the first step of the ladder, and then okay, we did that. Oh, we can also use that same technology to find the spinning rate of planets, right? Or, or um, planets or even uh, stars, right? Again, it will be the Doppler shift. So for example, if this is Mercury here, and that was done at the same time, you see how, how it's rotating. So if you send a ping here, when it's bouncing back, it's going to be more faster. Here it's going to move slower. So by, by using the Doppler shift, you see how it's being stretched and here it's being compressed because here it's coming toward you and here it's moving away from you, you can find the rotational speed. And the same technique can be used to find how fast the galaxy is spinning, for example. So that will be the Doppler shift. So, okay, so the next step is the parallax method. Parallax method is actually the triangulation method. And you can see that outside. So yesterday, I know if you, if you go, I went to Miami Beach, you know, in uh, Miami Beach, they have this beautiful park, right? They just um, updated it. And we've seen a lot of people taking measurements. Okay? It's called surveying. And they do that by triangulation. They are able to find the distance uh, of object or the height of building. So the idea is that, for example, you are aiming at that tree here from that location, and then you aim at the tree from this location there. So you know that distance here, you can find the, the angle there, okay, by, by which the tree seems to shift. So then you can find the distance between here and there. So it's the same thing as the, the finger. You see the finger here is shifting by a lot, here, the finger here is not shifting by much. So the shift here is the uh, angle that he is being swept. Okay, So this is called the parallax angle, by how much it's shifting, swifting, it's sweeping out an angle. So you can do the same thing for stars. And see how it was done very in a, in a very smart way because they just have found the distance between Earth and the Sun. Now so that will be one AU. So they have that step nicely calibrated. So now we know that distance here and this distance here. So we know that base. So in the summer, we're going to look at a star as seen on, on the very distant background. You can think of that as a spherical uh, a celestial sphere. And then you look at the same star in winter. So it's going to be shifted, right? The amount of shift, okay, will be used to find the distance between the star and the sun. Isn't that nice? But you can use that technique only for, because stars are so far away, like the, the closest one is about four light years away. You can use that technique only for really nearby stars, not, not further than let's say 10, about 10 light years away. Okay, otherwise you, you, have, you can use the same technique, but with a spacecraft, okay? And then, yeah, and then after that, you have to use other techniques. Okay, so I have a simulation and I have a movie. 
So I forgot, should I video an animation? Okay, should I start with the video? Or, um, should not space out. Okay, let's just let's start here. You see, the star is close, so the star is, so the parallax is large. And now, if you have a farther away, so let's, let's just explain. So this is the star, and this is the sun, and this is the earth going around the sun. So in that case, the star is close, and that will be the projection of the star on the background, right? And it's going to shift by it's going to shift by a lot. If the star is farther away, it doesn't shift that much. Is that clear? So you see, it's close. You're going to see winter or summer, okay? And if it's further away, winter and summer, you have a shift, but not that much. You see, it's sweeping out an angle. That will be the parallax angle. So let's see here. That's how surveyors... Um, In the 19th century, telescopes confirmed what early astronomers had suspected. The closest stars appear to move back and forth against the more distant ones as the Earth orbits the Sun. This apparent movement, known as parallax shift, can be used to calculate the star's distance from the Earth. The further a star is away, the smaller its parallax angle. For stars more... So you see the parallax angle here? So you, as, as the stars are farther and farther away, the angle gets so, so small, we cannot measure it anymore. So it doesn't work for stars over, you know, about 10 light years away from us. But it's the, it's the second step of the ladder. And then you calibrate. Than 300 light years away, the angle is so small that not even modern telescopes can measure it accurately. So parallax angle is only useful for measuring the distance of the closer stars. Okay, any question? So we use, in that case, we use a different unit of uh, distance, which is called the parsec. Okay, so one parsec is about three light years away. So if if you have a distance, if you have a distance between the sun and the earth of one parsec, the angle will be one arc second. So that will be the angle unit to measure uh, the angle, right? So we don't use degrees, we use arc second. So what's an arc second? It's one degree divided by 3600. So it's a very, very small angle. How small? It's going to be like if you take a one die, so it's very small, and place it 2.5 miles away from you, so from your perspective, that will be the angle, okay, that, that you see the, the dime, okay, the size, the size of the dime will be about one arc second. So it's a very, very small angle, okay? So we use that equation here because it simplifies the units. If the angle here is one arc second, so that means the distance here between the sun and the star is one parsec. You see, it's a very simple relationship. Distance equals one over the angle. So for test three, if I give you, you know, a simple equation to solve, it's just an inverse relationship. So I'm going to give you an example for that. But again, if you have an angle here of one arc second, that means the distance here is one parsec. And one parsec is three light years. So a very simple relationship. So if you have a one, 
1 over 1 is 1, and 1, 1 parsec. Okay? Not, not how, right? Example, if, if you have 2, so that, that here, that symbol here means arc second. So if the arc second is 2, okay, so 1 over 2, is 0 0.5, so that will be your um, uh, uh, 1 over 2 is 0 0.5, that will be the parsec. Okay, so parsec is the distance, okay, equals 1 over the angle in arc second. Is that clear? You do 1 over. So if the distance, sorry, if the distance is 2 parsec, the angle will be 0.5. Okay, if the distance is 10 par sec, 1 over 10 is 0.1. Okay, so no, not the what did I say? I'm, I'm confusing myself. If the distance is 10 par sec, 1 over 10 will be 0 0.1. Okay. And uh, the 0 0.1 will be the parallax angle. P is the angle, okay? If you have a distance of 10 per sec, which is about 300 light years, the parallax angle will be 0 0.01. So it's just an inverse relationship. Okay, that's, that's all there is to it. So again, if the, the, the a star is here, so the, the angle here swept is one arc second. The distance here between the star and the sun is one parsec. So you see, this is the sun here and that's the orbit of the earth. Is that clear? Right, it's just one over to so inverse relationship. Okay. So, um, okay, so here, let's take, a, let's take an example. If you take Alpha, Alpha Centauri, okay, so it's one of the closest stars from us. It's about four light years away. You look at that star in winter, and then you look at that star in the summer, so it seems to shift. It's going to sweep an angle of 0 0.77 arc second, one arc second is one degree divided by 3600. You take the reciprocal, so you take one over 0 0.77, that's gonna give you the distance, which is 1.3 per second. Is that clear? Yes, for everyone? It's not very hard. Uh, the maximum, maximum we can go is 100 light years because otherwise the angle is very small. Usually we stop at 10, 10 uh, light years away from us, right? About 30, 30 light years. So in, instead, what can we use for farther away stars up to 100 light years away? We can use a spacecraft. So spacecraft will be the same idea. Okay, except the orbit will be larger, and because the orbit will be larger on the Sun, for example, or on the Earth, then uh, you can, uh, or on the Sun, then, then we have, we, we, have um, we, we can measure further away distance. So they did that between 1999 and 1993, and remember Hipparchus? was the first Greek to have a very good measurement for the distance to the moon and the size of the moon. So that's why they named that spacecraft Hipparchos. And the mission went from 1989 to 1993. So that way they had an old catalog of stars, right? A distance to those stars, up to 100 light years away. Okay, and then next step, we use, see, we are here, parallax, so it works with spacecraft, it works for just the Earth going around the Sun. Next, if we want to find stars in other galaxies, we're going to use a different method. And this is called the HR method, right? It's called the 
main sequence fitting. That's that's what I'm going to explain. Is that clear? So going up steps the steps. So that will be the parallax method. Okay, so next step, we can use the technique of standard candles that I have explained many times, right? So we know, if you know how bright an object is supposed to be, like a candle, okay? You know it's oomph, it's luminosity, it's power, how much energy is being produced every second and because that object is placed farther away from you it's not going to be as luminous you're going to have an apparent luminosity or brightness so you compare luminosity to brightness and you can find the distance isn't that interesting so this is called a standard candle and um, of course you do a little bit of math uh, it's not that hard of the math. You see, you know how, how luminous an object is supposed to be. You measure how luminous it appears to be. And you use the inverse square law to find the distance. So again, if the distance is multiplied by 2, the apparent luminosity will be divided by 4. If the distance is multiplied by 3, the apparent luminosity will be divided by 9. So typical question on test 3. If the distance is multiplied by 5, luminosity will be divided by... 5 squared is 25. Very good, okay? So it's uh, you, you can see that here, all that energy spread out here, it's going to be spread out over a larger area. So here the thickness will be divided by 9. Okay? So that's what uh, we call standard candle. So we can use the luminosity of an object to find the distance to the object. Okay, so the next method use the HR diagram. Okay? Men, it's called main sequence fitting. So we have what it's called open cluster. Cluster, so it's a group of stars that were born at the same time from the same cloud, from the same material. So all the stars in a cluster have the same age because it's like tweet, okay? They were born at the same time. And they also have the same distance from Earth. So it started with a nebula, a cloud of dust and gas, and then clumps, you know, came together and you have new stars. But all those stars here are bound together with gravity, it's like the glue, and they all have the same distance, and they all have the same age. Okay? That's that's not hard. To understand, open cluster are the one that is used. They are young, younger cluster. So what we hope is still to have like hot stars hanging around uh, those those uh, inside those clusters. So they have found they are found usually like uh, in the, in the arms of uh, spiral galaxy. And then you have also what it's called globular cluster make a, like a blob. So in that case, those those clusters are older and they are found like uh, in the halo of uh, galaxies. Example is the M87. Do you remember it's where a uh, black hole was fi uh, um, picture. I mean, it's the first time they took a picture of a black hole at the center of that uh, uh, M87 of that cluster here. Okay, so how, how can we use the HR diagram as a standard candle? So you take the cluster okay, of stars and you're going to plot all the stars here uh, according to their color or temperature and their luminosity. 
So in, in that same cluster, you're going to have small stars that are red dwarf. You're going to have stars like our sun, and you're going to have big stars, so they will be blue stars. All of them have the same age, and all of them will be located at the same distance. Are you with me? So here, you can have the apparent luminosity. Okay, so what's going to happen? If, like, let's take, let's take an example. So that's what you expect. So you see how it shifted down. So you see now, because it's farther away, the whole cluster is not going to be appear as bright. So when you go and plot the stars, you still get the main sequence, but the main sequence is shifted down. Does it make sense? Because it's farther away. So the whole cluster behaves like a candle that you hold in your hand, right? You place the candle farther away from you, all the stars in that cluster will appear not as bright as they are supposed to be. Are you with me on that? So all the clusters should look like this because any cluster you have red dwarf, yellow dwarf, and blue stars, and now the whole sequence is going to be shifted down. By measuring that shift here, vertical shift, then we know the distance because that will be how bright it appears to be, how bright the stars are supposed to be, and finding that shift, you can you can find the distance. Is that clear? So the best example are two clusters here. You have the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. And the uh, Iadids, I don't know if I say it right, but I have pictures here. Let's see. Okay, it's in the you see constellation Taurus again. Let's see if I have a picture. Iadids, so you have the Pleiades here. Hyades, where is it? Here. Looks beautiful, right? It's a cluster, okay? All those stars were born at the same time. All the stars are at the same distance and they are glued together because of gravity. And when you compare the edge, so you take the stars in the Pleiades, you plot them in an HR diagram, and you take all the stars from Aadis here, that group of stars here, and you plot them, you see, there is a shift. Which one do you think is closer to us? The, the, red, the red one or the blue one? The, the blue is closer? Which one is the most uh, luminous? Luminosity is on that uh, axis, right? So if you go up, it's going to be more luminous. So which one appears more luminous? No, no, okay, I see, it's, it's it just, they use blue like this, okay? But it's, it's the main, what you see here, it's just the main sequence. They just made the main sequence blue for one cluster and red for the other cluster so we can tell them apart, okay? But it has nothing to do with the luminosity. And you see luminosity is on the y-axis, so which one is the brighter? You see luminosity goes... Uh, dim, brighter, 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 brighter. So you take one star here. Which one is the brightest? The one belonging to Iadis or the one belonging to the Pleiades? Pleiades, right? It's brighter. So if it's brighter, it means it's Close. closer. Very good. Okay? So if we know that the Iadis, for example, is uh, 150 light years away, okay, and we know the shift in brightness, then we can find the ratio between the distance, okay. So, for example, if the Iadis is 2.5 closer than the Pleiades, 
if you square it, you get 7.5. Okay, so if you know the difference in brightness, then you can find the difference in distance. So doing that, okay, you do the math. You see that Pleiades is 400 light years away and Iades is 150 light years away. So the point of that is not for you to uh, do math, it's just to understand that we can use the HR diagram and clusters to find distances, right? Given that all the stars here in the cluster were born at the same time and are located at the same distance. Farther and farther and farther away the cl cluster is, then the luminosity is going to decrease. By how much it's going to decrease relative to a cluster we know the distance, it's going to give you the distance to that other clusters. Is that clear? So, uh, so that way you use parallax okay, to find the distance, for example, to Iodis, and then, then we can use the HR technique to find the distance to the Pleiades. So we, we are moving on the distance ladder. Okay, so we found AU using radar, and then you can calibrate parallax okay, to find nearby stars. And now we are far farther away stars in the Milky Way, and we use that technique, which is a standard candle. Okay, so we measure how bright that main sequence here appears to be, and we compare to how bright that main sequence is supposed to be, and we can find the distance. So that's the idea behind the standard candle technique. Did I lose anyone? So it's a bit of math, but not much, okay? So we'll, uh, we'll go back to that next time here, that computation there. And so 